So Piotr Faliszewski, committee scoring rules, how to choose a good committee. We have, we have in Serbia a lot of committees. Usually when you don't want to have a job done, you form a committee. So, But I guess this is something different. <laughs> Please, Piotr. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, I feel a bit well strange giving this talk because, as opposed to I guess most of the other talks, I actually don't want to change the world. I simply want to look at one simple problem and just understand it a bit, maybe make you think how you're doing things and why they can be maybe done better. And uh, the talk is about choosing committees. But before we can think about choosing committees and why it's interesting, let's first think about single winner elections. So things like choosing president or choosing a time for a meeting. Um, usually we start with some set of candidates. Uh, people form preferences. They decide who they like. They decide who they don't like. Uh, there's some voting rule depending on the world we live in. It'll be one rule or the other, and eventually one person comes out. And I claim that this is a boring setting. And the reason is that uh, essentially, uh, whenever we have a single winner election, we simply want someone who is ranked as highly as possible by as many people as possible. This is, of course, impossible uh, because these are conflicting uh, needs, but this is a single dimensional tension. If we're, if we're choosing a president, it's perfectly fine that there's a large minority that's unhappy with the president. I'm sure anyone from US can understand. Um, and then if you're choosing a meeting uh, of a group, meeting time of a group, it's actually unacceptable that there's a large minority that is ignored. You know, it's perfectly fine if not everyone, if nearly, if essentially everyone dislikes the actual meeting time, but everyone can attend. So the, if you're choosing a president, maybe plurality rule is good. If you're choosing meeting time, maybe doodle is good. And it's all about tension on this. Do we, hear, do we care about how highly this person is ranked or by how many people? On the other hand, I claim that choosing committees is a multi-dimensional problem. So if we're choosing a group of people, it's no longer a one-dimensional issue. It's no longer that uh, we simply have one thing to think about, one decision. So if we're choosing a parliament, uh, we need to, probably we care about proportional representation. So the, num the views that are in, in the parliament should be represented proportionally to how society thinks. And okay, so for, that's, that's one option. But uh, imagine of a completely different application of choosing a committee. Uh, now we have a committee of movies that you can put on a transatlantic flight. And now it's really not about proportionality, because if it was about proportionality, then maybe we'd just put Hollywood blockbusters all over the, the plane, and that's what everyone would have to watch. But maybe we can just put some of them, that makes 90% of the uh, passengers happy. Then we can put a documentary, uh, something about, you know, from various minority groups. And uh, essentially, uh, we, can, we can have a diverse set of movies that will cover the interests of everyone. And everyone can find a single movie they can watch. And it's completely not proportional. So uh, in particular, whoa, so much for the slides. So hopefully this will come back. Uh, Anyway, uh, if, we're, uh, if we have two candidates running for parliament and they represent the same point of view, then if they have enough support, both of them should get in. And if they have less support, only one, and if not enough support, neither. Uh, if we have two similar movies, say Batman and Superman, um, maybe you can only put one of them in the diversity setting. Okay. On the other hand, if we're choosing a shortlist, if we're just choosing, say, winners of a competition, or people you want to hire in your company, uh, or finalists, of whatever they need. then you want, it's a committee of finalists, committee of winners, but you want a completely different rule. Because if there are two similar guys, either both of them get in or neither of them gets in. You know, aside from boundary cases. 
And these are philosophically three completely different settings. So we have at least a two-dimensional uh, space here of possible outcomes. And in fact, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional setting. And uh, in the first half of my talk, or possibly all of my talk if I talk slowly, uh, I simply want to show you how very basic choice of rules affects the kind of committee that we're getting. Okay. Uh, so we will be starting, my goal is to talk about committee scoring rules, but first uh, let's look the at the single winner setting. Uh, because I want you to understand the model that we're working in and the very basic notions. So we have a set of candidates. In, throughout this talk, I will have candidate red, orange, pink, blue, and green. And I haven't yet been able to give a talk about this without mixing the colors, sorry. Um, and our basic input is that we're assuming that voters somehow can form preference orders. So voter V1 says red is best, then orange, then pink, then blue, then green. So somehow in economics, people believe that people have this in their minds. Probably not. Uh, but, of course, there are settings where this really happens. So, if you think about sports competition, imagine that this is a Formula One, say, racing, and uh, the red driver came first, then orange, then, and so on. So, in sports, we actually get this data. Uh, when people vote, they can, we can ask them to provide ballots of this form. So, this is possible. And in the world of uh, single winner scoring rules, what happens is that we assume you have some function that, that connects position in the preference order with a score. So this is called Borda score. It's simply a linearly decreasing function. So it's if you're best, you have highest score. If you're second best, you get a bit less, and so on and so on. If you look at Formula One racing, that's more or less what they do. Eurovision Song Contest, that's what they do. Um, ski jumping, more or less, that's what they do. So a lot of sports competitions use things like that. Another possibility is approval. You can simply say, I approve the best and the second best. Then it's called two approval. And this is very basic uh, voting used in politics. Usually, when, at least in Poland, when people vote for parliament, uh, we're, we're allowed to name a party, and within that party, say, three people who we want to enter the parliament. Okay, and the idea of single winner scoring rules is that we sum up scores for, so for example, in this case, the red would get 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus, well, 0, 0, and 1. Okay, so this is one people can do things easily uh, this way, but what we want is, uh, we want committee rules. And this is, uh, we'll actually introduce uh, very complicated mathematics uh, to explain very simple things, which means we're scientists. Uh, and the way we're doing it is that uh, a committee scoring rules is, works as follows. So as before, we have a preference order. We assume that every voter gives us something like that. And if we have a committee, so if somehow from whatever, uh, I'm trying to evaluate a committee of red, pink, and blue, uh, I'm assuming I have a function that given position of this committee, this guy is on position one because he's first, Position two is not taken, but three and four is. So the position of this committee is one, three, four. And I have a function that assigns a score to this committee. And there are some technical um, things to think about here, but essentially I have a simple function that based on the position of guys in the committee assigns the score. And uh, now I will show you actually five examples of rules and how they behave depending on uh, how this scoring function is chosen. So here are the examples. So here, this is showing that uh, there's mathematics and symbols and uh, pretty, pretty, pretty. And here's the actual understanding. Uh, so the first rule is called single non-transferable vote. It means using one approval. This is probably what you know from voting in your country. It means I give one name and whoever is mentioned most frequently wins. Except that I'm choosing committee. So if I'm choosing K people, for example, if I'm choosing two people, here red guy is first twice, pink lady is first twice, they have two points, they're both in the committee. Okay, nothing too exciting so far, except that actually one of the uh, revelation moments we had when working on this committee stuff was when we tried to understand and visualize the results. And now I will show you that. What you see here is, well, a bunch of points. Uh, but actually, uh, they were, uh, there, there are four Gaussian distributions here. 
Uh, there are black points and there are gray points. The black points are candidates, the gray points are voters. And uh, there's a basic model of how people believe that preferences are formed. So for example, if I'm, say, a, a voter around here, how do I decide who I like best? I can say I can essentially sort these guys in increasing order of distance. And you know, whoever is closest to me, I like best. Whoever is farthest, uh, I like least. There's some grounding for that in uh, political science. So sometimes people believe that maybe one axis is, for example, personal freedom, one, the other axis is economic freedom, and you can choose between these options, whoever is closer ideologically to you, then this is a possibility. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation, think of uh, participatory budgets that were mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Maybe it's a map of a city, and there are projects that can be done in various areas of the city, and there are people who live there. And the closer a project is to me, then the more I like it. So if we use this single non-transferable vote, if we choose a committee of one, it's somehow here. And if I, as I keep on increasing the committee, it looks completely random. Uh, it also looks like my computer really does not want to present things. OK, whatever. Um, so essentially, as I keep adding things, it's completely random, and it's exactly what you should expect. Because we're looking at top position only. There's about 1,000 black dots here, 1,000 gray points. It's complete random. So when people told you that plurality voting, when you just give one name, sucks, they were right. It is simply, the results here are purely a uh, random artifact of whatever was happening. It just doesn't work. I mean, it works in politics because, say, if we have elections with three guys running for president, you cannot split too much. But it doesn't scale. OK, so with plurality voting, we, get, we, had, we had this complete random choice uh, in, this, in this system. So of course, no one in the right state of mind would say do participatory budgeting this way. OK, the next system, border rule. So we had uh, scores decreasing linearly. Uh, we have, say, red guy gets 15 points. It's 4 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4 and whatever. This is the system used in, uh, in, uh, in, in sports. So uh, this Formula One, Eurovision, and whatever. Now, think for a moment what will happen when I start increasing the committee. One guy is winning here. If I start increasing the committee, what will happen is they're all in the center. And these are the same preference orders as before. This is exactly the set, same set of points. You can see the completely different behavior. And there are two interpretations of that. One, this is the rotten consensus. These are people that no one likes them very much, but no one hates them too much either. Or it means if we're running participatory budgets and uh, we're not putting much attention, we're simply funding projects in the center of the city because everyone can go there. Uh, but a positive interpretation is this is actually fantastic for sports competitions because all these guys are similar to each other. It means this society has a notion of what it means to be good. The good people get in, they're similar to each other, those that didn't perform nearly as well are out. So somehow sports competitions are actually using the right uh, rule by, uh, I don't know, they were somehow smart. The next rule, okay, this is, uh, this is my, uh, somehow, I, I really like to show how bad this rule is because this is one of the most popular rules, that if you ever come up with how to choose a committee, like how to choose interns to hire in your company, how to accept your PhD students, how to choose a city council, many people will propose this rule. This is called block. It means if we're choosing a committee of size two, just let everyone name two guys, or if the committee size is K, let everyone name K guys. Whoever is mentioned most frequently gets in. It's extremely natural. It's extremely simple. It has extremely unexpected consequences. So the, essentially, the system means you forget about the, these non-ranked guys. Um, here we have two, three ties in this case, whatever. But if we run it on this, on this data that we've seen before, uh, we'll see what happens. So let's say that this is, this is actually, uh, say, uh, University of Dauphin in, uh, or whatever, some, some schools were using it for choosing uh, PhD students. 
so imagine we're, we're choosing, if we're choosing a single PhD student, this is this guy. Now, actually, we have space for four. Okay, different. Uh, as we keep on increasing the committee size, it keeps on, it keeps on fluctuating completely. Ra well, it's not random, actually. In this very case, it more or less found, finds the centers of density in this case, but it is not true. It is not a general feature. Yes? Uh, in this, so in this graph, this is simply a two-dimensional space. These are points that were generated. So this is not, these are not true opinions. Uh, I just, uh, there are four Gaussians, and I, gen uh, I generate one quarter of points from one Gaussian, one quarter for the other, and, and so on. And uh, so you mean the red one, the red ones? Yeah. The red ones are, uh, so if, uh, so say, let's say the black points are the voters. So if I'm a voter, I sort the gray points uh, by the distance there uh, from me. The closer one I rank first, the, further, the farthest one I rank last, and so on and so on. And then I run this block commit uh, selection. I'm saying in this case it's probably, uh, I can see probably something like 50 points out of this thousand I'm choosing, and this is the result. Uh, so, so one of the things, now I'm decreasing the committee size, you can see how, it's, how it keeps on changing. So essentially, if you're using this rule, imagine that if you were a PhD student applying for a position, you could uh, get an, a letter from the university. You know, we, we had space for 10 students and you are among them. Congratulations, you're in. And next week you get another email. Actually, we had room for 11 students. You're no longer good enough. This is what the system can actually cause. And the behavior is kind of strange. I mean, here it does not look too terrible, but I will show you more evidence. And the reason why, I, why I'm putting so much emphasis on that is that this is by far the most popular way of voting when people think of choosing committees. Uh, so in this case, if this was participatory budgeting, we would somehow choose centers of communities. But actually, uh, this is kind of uh, an artifact of how this data was chosen. Um, okay, so these were simple rules. Uh, one more rule that is kind of complicated that I will show you is the rule of chamberlain Courant. It is very similar to Borda, so we still we have this linear Borda scores, but now, if I'm choosing, if the committee is, say, red-green, I'm saying that uh, red is the representative of voter one. And green is the representative of voter two, because she's better than red. She's the best member of the committee uh, for this voter, and so on, and so on, and then another uh, representative. So, this rule is based on the idea of representation. So, when I'm representing, uh, when, when, I, when, when, I have, when I'm given a committee, I can evaluate its score by simply summing the points of the representatives. Uh, it's a nice rule. It was invented in the 80s. Uh, it's actually promoting diversity. It is, so you can think of this as, if these were kind of avatars for movies, uh, then this means we have two guys wa wanting to watch the red movie and uh, four guys wanting to watch the uh, green movie. The problem is, it's NP hard to compute the results of this rule. The good news is that NP is a different shape of animal, and actually these days, uh, as some people joke, NP is the new P. And uh, we have ILP solvers, we have SAT solvers, we have whatever heuristics. So in fact, if I run Chamberlain Courant, you can see how it beautifully spreads uh, the committee over the whole spectrum. If this was participatory budgeting, it would mean every area of the city gets something. Of course, it's not so trivial to make it participatory budgeting problem, because we're completely ignoring the budgets and the costs uh, of the issues, and uh, actually gener generalizing that is a non-trivial problem. Uh, but we have a nice rule like that. Uh, there's also a bunch of other rules, like proportional approval voting, which in fact generalizes the don't apportionment method, which is used for choosing parliaments in, uh, in Poland, in France, in many other countries. Uh, we, can all cap we can capture all that, and I will not go into details, except that I will actually show you one rule uh, which is used uh, in practice, uh, in, in particular in Australia and in some, uh, some of these. Um, okay. Uh, it's actually the first talk I'm giving you with this laptop, so it's double exciting for me. Um, and so this is actually one of the only non-trivial rules that is actually used in practice. It is used by Australians. It has terrible, terrible properties. For example, under STV, uh, it is possible that if you 
improve somebody's position who was a winner, then the guy ceases to be a winner. It happened in Australia. Uh, it also has some other downsides. But it simply works. Because uh, the, oh, the, the way the system works is that uh, it's an elimination process based on plurality scores. So we look who is ranked uh, most often first. And uh, we eliminate the guy with the lowest score. So in this case, the green lady is never first, so she's eliminated. Uh, and we have n voters, n is six, committee size is two. We divide uh, by three, but we need more. So essentially, we need uh, three points to join the committee. Uh, and now we look who has fewest scores. Red guy has two, orange has one, blue has one, uh, pink has uh, two. So either blue or uh, orange will disappear. In this case, we chose blue just because. Uh, and now uh, orange has two points as well. So now we have a tie, so we have to eliminate whoever we choose. Uh, in this case, it's the red guy. It's often done by random choice. Some universities actually use it. Australia uses it. And now uh, you can see that the pink lady has her three representatives. Uh, so does the orange guy, so they win. Now, if we look at our data, if we repeat the same experiment, this horrible rule that is non-monotonic, that has various other faults, acts beautifully. It covers proportionally the whole society. Of course, you can say, we saw Chambalin Quran and it was not, it was, I was saying it's diversity, here I'm saying it's proportionality, and that's because I've, saw, I've seen the next slide. Uh, so I will, show, I will now explain you why these rules are different. So after running these experiments, uh, we actually uh, repeated each of these experiments. If the, we fixed uh, essentially 200 voters, 200 candidates, committee size of 20, and we chose four distributions of candidates and voters all the same. So are the Gaussian circle, square, or four Gaussians. And we repeated 10,000 times each of these experiments, and we drew a two-dimensional histogram. If we run single non-transferable vote, it just copies the initial distribution, but it's a random fluke. It's completely ignored, doesn't matter, whatever. It's just a bad rule. Don't use it. Um, you know, don't talk to people who want to use it. Uh, single transferable vote. It copies the initial distribution as well, but it does so uh, in a kind of non-randomized way. Really, every single election uh, looks more or less like the initial ones. Of course, there are some things like, you can see here that on the edge, we're not choosing guys. Simply the extremists, the, the extreme extremists don't really get in, ever. Uh, by the way, the, the, the idea of the picture is that the, the bluer a point is, the, the more frequently a candidate from that uh, area was selected. If you use Chamberlain Courant, you see it's, it's relatively copying the initial distribution with some strange things. So you would have never thought, but there is actually support for some extremists in Chamberlain Courant. It's inherent in the rule, you would have never seen it in the de definition. If we use block, this was the rule I told you I really... The, okay, I'm not saying it's the devil itself. Yeah. I'm si simply saying be cautious. Uh, but uh, you can see that on these uh, four Gaussians, it more or less found the centers of community. But in the uniform distribution, somehow the square in the circle, the ring. Here, even more amazingly, in the Gaussian, you, maybe you don't see it, but in the very center of the block of, the, of this... Uh, you have a lower probability of being uh, elected. So people who are most liked ha have slightly lower chance of being elected than people who are just popular but not the most popular. So, so far I found only one reason why this rule, one application when, when this rule would be really reasonable, but I'm sure, pra I mean, in practice it might be different. So that's why I'm not saying it's the end of the world yet. And of course, K-Board chooses centers always. Uh, so I told you also that the, this Chamberlain Courant and STV are different in the sense that one is diversity, one is proportionality, and you cannot see it here. It's simply not enough evidence. But uh, if we look at the situation when we have, say, all the voters are in one square and all the candidates are in the other square, now you see a big difference. STV tries to put, choose the candidates that are as close as that. Somehow, it's impossible to satisfy these voters, but it does so as well as possible. Whereas Trembling says, yeah, whatever, you just have one guy, then we choose the rest here. And uh, so this is, the, this is the difference. Okay, so uh, this was essentially the first half of the talk, let's say the first logical half of the talk. Um, 
And what I want, so this was experiments. This was, this was a lot of fun to do. And this really opened our eyes on what committee selection does. But what we really want to do is we want to understand these rules. We want to understand these committee rules. And uh, we realized that there's, if you look at this class of committee scoring rules, we chose it because we invented it and that's why we like it, but there's plenty of other classes possibly, except that committee scoring rules have actually quite nice properties. So as a basic sanity check, if we have two elections with the same result, and if you put them together, we still get the same result. It seems obvious that all rules should have this property. No, 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 no. This is all committee scoring rules are exactly the rules that satisfies this sort of consistency. Plus a few uh, obvious axioms that uh, every reasonable rule has to satisfy such that if you change the name of the voters, the result doesn't change. Uh, so the only rules that have this property are committee scoring rules, nothing else. It's a painful, painful proof. It's 40 pages of mathematics to get this result. And it's based on another 40 pages of mathematics done much earlier by others. Uh, another nice thing is that the rules have a feature which we call uh, candidate monotonicity, which means if we have a committee, say, and if we improve the position of one member of the committee, in this case the green lady, well, the committee can change, but whoever was improved will stay in the committee. Okay, so it's nice. Uh, so it's, it means at least that on the individual level, the committee members want to improve. They have that in incentive. Uh, but it might be that by improving myself, I hurt my friends. Okay, uh, but unfortunately these are more or less two or three basic properties that are common to all committee scoring rules. And if we want anything other which is kind of non-trivial, we need to look at the classes of rules. And if we look at the space of all committee scoring rules, we can say things such as these three first rules, which essentially meant uh, I'm assigning a score to every column and I'm summing up the scores for each committee, each committee member separately, and I'm summing these up. We call them weakly separable rules. They are the simplest one. They have polynomial time algorithms. Uh, we put them in one class, we'll think about them. Then things like chamberlain Courant, which essentially just look at the score of the representative. We call them representation focused. We put them in another group. Then we put yet another group, which is technical and I'm not going to talk about it much. And finally, there's a huge group that inv includes everything here. They're called OWA-based, which essentially means they're sum of scores of the same type multiplied by certain uh, coefficients. It's basic mathematics. It's incredibly powerful what you can express this way. Uh, but we'll not, we're not going there in much detail. If we just look at these three basic groups, it mean, we realize we actually understood something correctly by choosing them, because it seems that on the intersection of each of these groups, there is one well-known rule, but we're not going into that detail either because what we want to understand is somehow, uh, I told you that there are these multi-dimensional different goals that uh, we are interested in while uh, we, we look at these committee rules. So this is our space of rules, and now I told you that we have basic properties such as consistency and this monotonicity, but uh, now uh, we want to put conditions on what committees should actually, what, what properties should be satisfied by rules for choosing various committees. So if our goal is individual excellence, so if we're choosing these sports finalists or you know, whatever, then what are our requirements? The first one is that we want to get, we don't want to have this problem with block. So the problem with block, uh, as we said, if we choose committee of one, red guy gets in, if we increase the committee, then now the green lady and the pink lady have more score, uh, so they, they get in. So essentially, uh, what we say is that the basic property that we say is that if we increase the committee size, it cannot remove anyone who was already in the committee. It can only add a new person. Uh, so it turns out that within the class of committee scoring rules, there's an exact characterization of rule with that property. The only way to achieve this property is that you assign a score to every column, and the score does not change with the committee size. This is obvious that this, this gives us the result. It's really not obvious to prove that these are the only rules like that. Uh, but it works. Uh, so the theorem, the theorem said that we have this exact characterization 
Uh, so Block is ruled out, but SNTV and KBorda are in. Now, another thing that uh, we thought is somehow a nice property is that if we have a committee, and it's supposed to be for this individual excellence, if somehow one member of the committee improves, but it doesn't affect the other members of the committee, then the committee should stay the same. And it means that we actually showed that these are exactly the weakly separable rules, which means that K border, SNTV, and block. But if we put these two uh, requirements together, we have a kind of good axiomatic justification that if you want a rule for choosing individually excellent guys, then you're, you're probably looking at either SNTV or K-Board. So axiomatics gave us an answer, except that then we realized, oh my god, uh, these are uh, the two rules that satisfies these two axioms, are SNTV and K-Board, some other rules as well, but these are the, the, the most well-known one. And if we look at our basic result, and we have K-Board and we have SNTV, they give completely different results. Uh, so, Thing. So, was it a failure of axiomatics, or was the failure of our experiment? Uh, in fact, luckily, we realized it's neither. So, k border is naturally used for sports, and it has this idea of choosing somehow rotten consensus but best quality. Uh, but we actually run into a situation where, for exactly the same purpose, SNTV was used. This, this was actually in the time of the uh, Four Hill tournament in ski jumping. And since a uh, Polish player uh, or Polish ski jumper had won the competition, there was lots of hype on that in the Polish media. And one of the articles was uh, simply asking who is the best ski jumper of all time. And they gave a ranking. They took the world championships from, I don't know, 50 years back or whatever, how long it ran. And for every competition, they simply looked at who won. So they looked at the top position. And they said, this is one point. And they looked just simply whoever won most world championship competitions. So a journalist completely unaware of mathematics uh, used SNTV to choose the best ski jumpers of all time, individually excellent candidates. So it simply means that our understanding, we're touching some part of the cake, but we haven't solved the whole problem. And people can choose the, what, they, what they really like, uh, what's good for a particular application. Of course, this also made us sad, because it meant that after five years of difficult mathematics, we were finally proved right by a journalist who just simply thought it was a good idea. But that's how it's life. Okay. Uh, another thing is na uh, in this nature of committees uh, thought is we had this diversity and coverage. And uh, if you want a diverse committee, I gave you the example of the movies on the plane, but it's also a very much portfolio building. So for example, if company wants to, uh, if, I don't know, car manufacturer usually has one car of each type to offer, or yeah, if you're running a supermarket, then you want to probably have all types of food, but you have to choose which ones uh, from each kind. So you want some sort of diversity. And uh, since we're kind of running out of time, so I will be a bit quick here, but uh, the basic axiomatic requirements for diversity are that if it's possible to give everyone the best representative, uh, then we do it. K Borda fails it, Borda Chamberlain Courant satisfies it. Uh, some other rules, rules as well. And if we lo look at our space of rules, it seems that all the representation focus have this property. If you can give everyone the best guy, that's what they care about. They care about the top position only, then they do it. But some other strange rules do it as well. So the other thing we looked at is maybe some form of monotonicity. If we have a committee and the best member of this committee improves, then the committee should still be the best if we only care about diversity or coverage. Because, uh, and then with some thinking, we, should, we know that non-crossing monotonicity is weakly separable rules. And actually, non-crossing monotonicity is stronger. It requires more than this top member monotonicity. So top member actually included all the representation-focused rules and the weekly separable rules. And luckily, as you see by a complicated set operation here, if we put narrow top consistency and top member monotonicity together, then actually they exactly classify representation-focused rules. 
So it means we actually, so it was, it's kind of intuitively obvious that these representation focus rules should be good for representation and diversity, mostly because we chose the name, but, uh, but we actually can prove it formally, that we axiomatically can justify that these are exactly rules to look at if you want diversity uh, in your committee, and if you want high quality diversity. Okay, Chamberlain Courant is NP complete, but we can deal with it. Uh, so to summarize the talk uh, and to mention a few challenges, uh, the question is how to choose the right rules. So we have some of our experiments, we have some pictures, they give you understanding of what happens in these rules. And they give you understanding that you probably wouldn't have had if you simply looked at the definitions. But does it work in practice? Do we, which pictures are good? It's really debatable. Uh, we have some work on how to design rules. So here, in this case, we chose rules and we drew pictures. In this work, we drew pictures and then we computed the rules that achieve them. And so this reverse problem is actually somehow possible to solve. So if, if you give us an application, say your distribution of preferences, we can try to come up with optimal rule for that. Uh, how to compute the committees. We, there are some approximation algorithms, there are some heuristics. Uh, for non-political applications, we can probably compute solutions often. Uh, but this is by no means solved. Uh, what are the practical applications? So now, actually, two people from industry uh, came to me and they said, we want to do PhDs on committee selection because that's the problems we run in our com company. I said, really? And they said, oh, no, of course, come to me. Uh, but, uh, so there is, there is interest from the, uh, from the industry. Uh, sports, it just works. Politics, no way. Uh, I mean, we can understand things about politics from this research. Politicians will never use it. Uh, how meaningful are the results? How will people's behavior change when they know these things? How will they, be, will they behave game theoretically? Uh, how they actually vote in reality? There's some data uh, on the internet there's from real elections, like from Dublin municipal elections, from whatever else. Uh, but people have not looked at it too carefully yet. So are our pictures really meaningful or not? Don't know. Want to find out. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And the software that we used for the pictures is available on GitHub. And there's also an introductory chapter uh, that more or less tries to explain what I said throughout this talk, uh, but in a co coherent and formal way. Thank you very much. Okay. Now there are some questions. How do political systems choose uh, committee scoring rules? Are they aware of fallacies of their selections? Um, how they really do it, it's, uh, so I would say it depends. So for example, in Poland, uh, we're, uh, we were using uh, first a uh, sound lagu uh, apportionment method, uh, which was uh, very proportional, more proportional than the don't method, and the effect was that we had 10, 20 parties running into parliament, getting into the parliament. Uh, there was always a minority, well, it, it was difficult to form a governing coalition. So at some point, there was some understanding that we need to switch to the don't method, which promotes larger parties. Now we have maybe five parties that can uh, actually enter the parliament. Uh, so I would say it's some sort of slow evolution. Um, but it's... Uh, of course, uh, another way to answer this question is that uh, somehow societies uh, see, look at the options available and they choose the worst one. Um, uh, so recently there was, uh, there was a referendum in England a few years ago. Uh, so what, they, what, they, uh, what, uh, what happens in the UK is that they're divided into districts and in each district they're, they're running a plurality election. So whoever has majority in the district gets, uh, gets into the parliament. It's a um, single representative districting. If, you, if, you're, if you're really unlucky, it's possible to have majority in the govern majority in the parliament with 25% support in the society with the system. They were given the option to adopt STV uh, under the name of alternative vote. There was a huge debate, there was a lot of discussions going on. Eventually, uh, the old system won. It's extremely difficult to change uh, political systems uh, while, while they're set uh, in state. That's why I actually care so much about participatory budgeting, 
is that this is a relatively new idea. I think we still can have some impact of how, how these things are done. And I'm claiming that lots of the time we don't really or truly know what we're doing when we're running these pastures. OK, what rules should be used in politics? Um, it's, I would say it's an answer be, beyond my competence. Uh, because it's, uh, it's about psychology, it's about sociology, uh, it's about how people behave. Um, I'm a computer scientist uh, who learned a little bit of economics and who once saw a political science article. And uh, my answer is that if you give me a rule, I can set, tell you what it does. But if I am to make a recommendation, I can say the don't apportion method is OK. Um, Santelago seems fine. Uh, single districts with single representatives, probably not so good. But there's far more uh, reasons why, pe why political systems uh, adopt voting rules that I would say this is far beyond uh, a, sim a simple uh, computer scientist. What are the axes of, uh, of your diagram? Uh, so uh, I, there, there was a partial answer. So the actual, uh, the actual axes there were not, essentially they, these were just geometric uh, axes, that's it. Uh, if you're a political scientist, then you can say that, uh, say, up-down is personal freedom, left-right is economic freedom, uh, communists on one side, uh, liberals on, one, on the other, and so on. And there are actual pictures of preferences like that from actual countries. Uh, so this, is, this sort of data is actually collected with actual interpretation. We simply, but what we used is a geometric toy. Another possible inter interpretation is this, are, this is a map of a city and people living in particular areas. I, I guess that question was asked on the fly as well. Um, okay, so that's how much I have to say. Thank you very much and enjoy your dinner. <laughs>